We are ready for the second talk here on the barn, uh, where we have uh, Andy with us, who will tell about uh, Jamstack and microservices, and also how to handle spikes at uh, certain periods. So yeah, please welcome Andy, Eva, Dale. Thank you. Hello, all. Can you hear me? Yeah. Good. Good, good, good. So I'm here to talk a little bit about uh, Umbrico Hardcore, Jamstack, and how we design for scale and performance, and also talk a little bit about sustainability as well, because it's intrinsically linked to performance. So hi, I'm Andy. Uh, I'm a long-term Umbrico user or abuser. I don't know, does anyone in the crowd recognize this? Yes? Well, OK, I've lied. I'm not here to talk about Jamstack. I'm going to read about XSLT and, no, I'm only joking. <laughs> Uh, I've been using Ambrico for a long time, since 2009. Um, and I guess I've seen a lot of developments in it. And I'm really excited about Hardcore and what we can do with Hardcore. So today, we'll start to look at some of those features. So Jamstack. I don't know if anyone knows what Jamstack is. I'm going to start with the basics, and then we'll go into a bit more detail. Jamstack start, stands for JavaScript API and Markup. Um, th there's one key principle of Jamstack, is the term pre-rendering or pre-compiling of pages. So it's very different from the old way traditional sites work. Um, we use JavaScript to pre-render pages, uh, which is the markup. And then we use APIs for anything we can't pre-render, so like dynamic data. For example, you could pre-render a home page, but you may have uh, a share price in it, and you can't pre-render a share price because it's going to constantly change. So we use APIs to pull those dynamically in. So the way, well, before we start with Jamstack, we'll talk quickly about how a traditional site works. I know you might roll your eyes, but it's quite important quickly to cover it. So you have a user on a client. They would make a request to a web server, like an old traditional Umbrico server. That may then make a request to an app server or an API, which in turn could hit a database or a CMS or God knows what, right, a cache or whatever it might be. And that request would then compile some HTML and pass it back to the user, which is incredibly inefficient. So now with Jamstack, we pre-render pages rather than going through these changes. So with the Jamstack approach, users still, use, still have a user, still have a browser. Those things haven't changed. Um, but instead, the user will hit a pre-rendered um, piece of HTML that sits inside a CDN. So instead of going all the way down the chain there, you've only kind of got that single HTTP request to uh, a CDN, which we can globally distribute, we can um, also handle incredible amounts of load. Um, and any other um, data that we can't pre-render, we would then use APIs and micro uh, microservices to, to pull back in, into, the, uh, into the client. <clears throat> so there are actually there's five key benefits of Jamstack, but I've only got four in here. The first one is performance. Obviously, it's not going all the way down the chain. You're only hitting that CDN. It's incredibly quick, and we've got some stats to prove that. It's also a lot cheaper. So like Azure infrastructure or AWS infrastructure is all costed for usage. So it's compute, it's data in, data out, and you are cutting that down dramatically. And we, we also have some stats on that. The next one is sustainability. And it's something I think that we should all be very mindful of. I guess in the audience, we have people that create products. We have people that commission products, use products. And the Earth is going through an existential crisis at the moment. It's every single person's responsibility in this room to start creating sustainable software. And the impact the internet is having on the environment is massive. I, I was at a, a Wired Security Conference uh, in 2017, and there was a stat then, bear in mind this is pre-COVID, so there are a lot more planes in the sky, but. There was a stat then saying that the internet produced more CO2 emissions than the aircraft industry. And now people are using the internet more. We're at home more. We're on team calls and Zoom calls and working remotely because of COVID. And there's also less planes in the sky because of COVID. So that stat would have dramatically changed as well. And I think some of the, some of the stats we have today around the, the websites we've seen under extreme load and the carbon emissions they've produced are really quite staggering. Next is developer experience. So with Jamstack, you can have separate microservices, decoupled front-end applications. Developers can work in isolation. 
is not like a monolithic application where you have to deploy to a single application, which can be clunky and hard work. You can do dedicated deploys to single pieces of uh, infrastructure or applications, which is much nicer and much easier. The fifth one I haven't got on here is security. So the attack vectors are dramatically increased with Jamstack. If you look at the traditional way, you've got a web server, you have to, if it's on a VM, you have to keep the operating system up to date or whatever packages are up to date and patching and yada, yada, yada. The attack vectors for Jamstack, where you just have pre-rendered HTML in a CDN, are dramatically decreased. So we, you can use lots of technologies to pre-render code. We, we've done it with Go and Python. The thing we're looking at today uh, is JavaScript languages. Uh, in React, you have Gatsby and Next, and we're mainly going to look at Next and how Next handles pre-rendering. Um, so to start off with, we have Umbraco Hardcore. This is where our content comes from. Uh, we get Umbraco Hardcore by a series of APIs. They have RESTful APIs. They have GraphQL APIs. They also pass uh, the objects to us in um, webhook responses. And that gets processed by a node application, which is running React and running Next, and does something called static site generation. And that's Next term for pre-rendering. And that happens on build. So when we build the site, we pre-render all the pages. Or we can hook into static site generation on, event -driven, uh, on an event-driven basis and do it per publish event or unpublish event or delete. So we can start to, to change the statically generated files on those events. Um, Next would then create a web page, which would be pre the pre-rendered that we were talking about earlier on. And then we would store that in cloud storage. In this case, we also put a CDN in front of it to handle some of the traffic we're talking about. Uh, then you have the browser. I said it's still there, um, which would then just make a hop from your, um, your browser to the CDN to your local edge. Um, and then return the, the pre-rendered page. So that would be what comes back to the user. Then for any other requests that we can't pre-render, and there's quite a few of them, we would then pull from APIs. And that's kind of like how the, the Jamstack principle works. There are some other terms to bear in mind. SSR, server-side rendering, the old-fashioned way. We can actually do a hybrid approach as well. We have a single page that's 90% statically generated. And then we can also go back to node and like, server-side render a certain percentage of it if we wanted to. There's also something called incremental site revalidation, which is the cache length of the pre-rendered page. So that means that instead of doing like um, clearing that cache or that pre-rendered page on an event, we can set a time for it. So after three days, the statically generated page would clear. The next user to hit the CDN would have a cache miss. That would be then reject, uh, go to the, the node application, which would then pre-render the page, stick it into the CDN, cache for, for, for three days. And lastly is on-demand revalidation. Now, this is quite a new feature in Next. It came out in Next 12.1, uh, which is something that was probably released a couple of months ago. I'm looking at my front-end developer. He's nodding. That's good. Um, and this was a big game changer for us, because before this, we had to make some really clunky hacks, and we couldn't hook into unpublish, delete, and publish events. And we had to sort of figure out how we were going to do it with incremental site revalidation. And even if you put a cache link for five minutes on a page, editors will get a bit annoyed and a bit frustrated if they're waiting five minutes to see the changes on the site. So this was a real big game changer for us. And we could hook into Umbrico Hardcore's webhooks and pre-render the pages um, using on-demand revalidate. So we've done this for two clients. I can't name who, who they are. But one is a, 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 an infrastructure provider for the UK that handles incredibly high spikes in traffic. Um, they, um, they're, un they're unplanned. So, for example, two months ago, on a weekend, we saw an unplanned event where 1.2 million unique users hit our application in, in, in 48 hours. Um, and we have to be able to scale for that. So it's not like, a, it's not like an e-commerce site where you know Black Friday is coming or something like that. This was completely unplanned. And we have to react. The other client we did, we used this for, was a global, uh, globally distributed business. They have offices across the world. And because we can pre-render um, the markup and put it into a CDN, users across the globe get the same performance. Doesn't matter if you're in South America, if you're in Denmark, if you're in China. 
everyone gets like lightning quick performance, and we don't have to worry about things like network latency and the hit that has on user performance. So there are four, this is the right number this time, <laughs> there are four uh, tips and tricks that I wish we learned before we started this project that I'm going to talk through now. One is how we handle CMS events. The other one is how we handle cache. The next one is how we handle site search. And lastly, there's some tips and tricks that are really obvious that I didn't think of at the start about how we handle content models. So <clears throat> you're going to get a few Azure infrastructure diagrams now, and I apologize. But at the heart of uh, our system is Umbrico Hardcore, probably why you guys called it Hardcore, because it's at the heart of people's systems. A bit of marketing there. Um, we hook into three types of webhooks, or three events. So we hook into the published webhook, we hook into the unpublished and delete webhook. Now, there's something to know here that the published webhook will return a full response to the page. So you get all of the, the JSON for that node that's published, where the delete and unpublished webhook will only return the IDs of the page. So you have to think about this when you're starting to design your systems. And with Next, they cache based on like the URI, the path for the page, not on an ID. So we had to think, that was a problem we had to think about how we, how we solved. So we subscribe to those uh, webhooks using some functions, some Azure functions. They're single responsibility. They are microservices. They have one job. It's to subscribe to a webhook and then post onto a service bus. Um, I was at an, a, an AWS, at the AWS Summit in London this year, um, and there was a really insp inspirational quote. But the thing is, I can't remember who it was from. But the, the gist of it was, if you don't have a queue inside a modern architecture system, it's probably a bug. So this service bus and the topics we build around it, our queue, is core to our system. And it's what you're going to see at the heart of all of our system, about how we handle all of our transactions. Now, the reason it's important for us to queue the events coming from the CMS is because we have uh, a large group of editors. And if you're making a published change to something like a navigation item, where you'd have to pre-render -pre the whole site. And we had 500 pages. That could take 30 minutes next to create all of that HTML. It's a really expensive uh, event. So we need to be able to process the um, events coming from the CMS in sequence and make sure we finish one and then move on to the next one to make sure that like, we don't suddenly delete something that we're publishing or you know, whatever it might be, have a concurrency issue. So that service bus is really key for us to handle like, the order in which editors are, are changing stuff. Uh, caching. Can you see the caching? Oh, no, an arrow's coming. There we go, caching. <laughs> um, the first time I've used the clicker. They're really cool, by the way. It's got a laser on it, but I'm a bit scared to. Oh, there you go. It's cool. <laughs> uh, so, again, our service bus is at the heart of our system. Um, we subscribe to uh, the service bus topic directly from the Node application. So, we have an app service. It runs Node, it's running React, it's running Next. And it subscribes to that queue and listens for um, the unpublish, publish, and delete events. It would then be responsible for recreating the page. We use on-demand revalidation to uh, take the URI for a published page, in this case, re-clear the local cache. And then we also call the endpoint for Azure Front Door. Uh, Azure Front Door is a WAF, so it's a firewall. It handles all our routing for our applications. So this is how we handle routing through to our APIs, and we call dynamic data, or we actually have proxies. So we, we don't expose any, any like keys or anything in the front end. So it routes all through to our proxies, which is our APIs. Uh, and it also acts as a CDN. And the CDN has endpoints that we can purge particular paths in the CDN. And that's how we kind of purge um, a, a, a page being changed and push it through to the CDN. It's all really rosy when it comes to the publish events. But as I said, the unpublish and delete events caused us a bit of a head scratching. We have the ID for the node, but we don't have the path. So we had to think how we were going to handle this. And it also links into how we handled site search. So site search uh, and search will stop. Uh, again, our service bus is at the heart of the, the, the project. It's the same service bus I was talking about before that's queuing all of our CMS events. We have two new functions. We have uh, one to remove an item from an index, and we have one to update an index. And this is linking into Azure Cognitive Search. It's a pass offering that it's a, it's a cognitive, well, 
it's Cognitive Search. It's, um, it's a pass index, uh, and we can do lots of really cool stuff like fuzzy searching on it for site search and all that kind of stuff. Um, yeah, it's just, just an index. Um, so when we get a delete or unpublish event from the node application, this will then make a request to our index, um, remove index function with the node ID, which would then in turn call cognitive search to get the URI. So remember, that's the bit that's cached in, 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 in Next. Return that to Next, so then Next can either delete or remove the page from cache and then push it to the CDN like all the other changes. And that's how we got past the only having the node ID. I think we, we, we've made a request to Umbrico, and I hope they, they hear it, that in the future we get the full um, model from delete or unpublish, but at this stage, this is how we handled it. Um, we then have a separate function at the, f at the start of the project as well for our site search. So this is the thing that's handling all of our fuzzy search and all that kind of stuff for our normal site search. And again, that's routed through via Azure CDM. Oh, Azure front door. So this is how it all fits together. So we have Heartcore at the, at the core. Uh, we have our three functions to handle publish, unpublish, and delete. We have a service bus in the middle to control the order of those events. We subscribe to the service bus using an app service and node for uh, running next to do all of our pre-rendering, which puts the pre-rendered assets into Azure front door and our CDN. And then we have uh, Azure Cognitive Search, a couple of extra functions to update and remove items from that index, and a separate function to call Cognitive Search to handle um, site search, which is an async call from the client to via that function via uh, front door. So <clears throat> last tip, and this is the obvious one that I was kicking myself. We started the project, and I didn't know none of us thought about this. It wasn't just on me, and I'm, I'm definitely not the brains behind the operation. But in the old days, I used to think it was really good practice to stick things like shared items, like your, your navigation models or um, uh, social links, whatever it might be, in your root node, in your home page node, because it kept it clean. And that's how we approached this project to start off with. But then we found that editors couldn't make a change to the home page without republishing the whole site, because it would, take the, it would have the navigation item in there. And every pre-rendered page has a navigation in it, in the, in the DOM. So we would have to, like, if someone wanted to change the home page banner, we'd have to republish the whole site. So we took things like our navigation links and all that kind of stuff out, and we decoupled them into separate settings. And it's also really important to make sure your editors are aware of how expensive it is to change those settings when, global, when they affect every page on the pre-rendering. But it was something really simple that I wish we knew at the start, because we had to do a bit of refactoring once we figured it out. Um, that would have saved us a, a, a lot of time. So back to the, the, the benefits of Jamstack, and I've got some stats here. There was performance, uh, there was cost, there was sustainability, and there was the uh, developer experience. So <clears throat> I didn't mention this at the start, but these, these are stats comparing against the Sitecore application. Originally, we had a Sitecore application, and our project was to migrate from Sitecore to Heartcore, heart uh, a lot of cores. Um, uh, and Sitecore was running uh, on some content delivery servers. It has a big solar index in it. It's got a database in it. It's actually got a couple of databases in it. And it was pretty beefy and very expensive. So first of all, these are, these are comparisons. So response time of loading the home page, this is just the home page, and obviously you don't know how big the home page is, so you're just going to have to use this as a bit of a, a rough comparison. Yeah, it's got a couple of images in it, a bit of text and some JavaScript. But you can see our response times to fully load the page are significantly down from 4.22 seconds to 1.41 seconds. And the other thing about that is that figure is the same everywhere in the globe, because it's in the CDN, which is pretty cool, right? It's really cool. <laughs> um, and who doesn't love to, to load test sites? We also load tested this, this solution as well. We, we load tested the Sitecore application under 20,000 concurrent connections. And we started to see like error rates of around 12, 15%. And it was performing like a, well, I went swear on stage. It wasn't performing very well. Um, we load tested the Jamstack solution, which is a bit pointless, but it was still quite fun because you're just load testing as your CDN. But hey ho, it's still something, something to do. Um, and uh, under 40,000 concurrent connections, we were still getting like 97% su like successful returns. Uh, so our error rate's really low, and our peak response time only went up to like eight seconds or something like that, which are considering it's 40,000 concurrent connections. 
If you think about Google, for example, and Google search, google.co.uk, I'm British, that's why I'm using co.uk, uh, the search button gets around 20,000 concurrent clicks, concurrent users. So any, any single millisecond in time, 20,000 people are clicking on that. So we're testing to some really like staggering numbers. <clears throat> um, cost. Uh, site called Cost of Fortune. I don't know if anyone knows that. It really does. Um, the license fees were hundreds of thousands of pounds a year. We also had like dedicated DigiSuite DAM, which we now use Emrico Media to handle. The infrastructure was costing 30,000 pounds a month. Um, and now we've like really significantly hammered that down. As your CDN is like 200 and something dollars. Um, Umrico Hardcore, the professional package, uh, is roughly $1,000-ish. I mean, some people are nodding, give it a take, <laughs> the odd dollar. Um, uh, and like, we, we, we drastically reduced our operation or, or our costs. Actually, the project, the way we sold this to our clients, and if you think about selling this to some clients, is we recouped our costs within three years. So the cost of the project, they recoup the value of that within three years. And after three years, they're saving like astronomical figures. So it kind of was like, it's kind of a bit of an easy sell, to be honest. Um, the next one is sustainability. Now, we use something called the website, websitecarbon.com. You should, guys should check it out. Go in there, you can put a URL of your site in, you can see how dirty it is, how much carbon it's producing. Um, the Sitecore application, for every click to the home page, produced 1.44 grams of carbon, where our new Jamstack solution produced 0.2 grams of carbon. Now, that doesn't mean much to me. I don't know about you guys. So I started to do a bit of maths, and I've got, I've got some notes here. I, didn't, I couldn't remember these stats. So I mentioned at the start we saw a peak in traffic, where we saw 1.2 million users hit our site. That would be the same if we were on Sitecore, as 1,728,000 grams of carbon, which still doesn't mean much to me. Now, a domestic flight produces roughly 255 grams of carbon per kilometer, I think it is. I think. Check, might have to check that one out. So, during that instant where we saw 1.2 million people hit the site, that would have produced an awful lot of carbon. And if you turn that into flights, that would have been the same as seven flights from London to Copenhagen. We'd save by being on this architecture. It's also worth bearing in mind that this is just the home page. So most users don't just go to the home page and bounce. Well, actually, a few of them do, looking at our Google Analytics, but some of them don't. Um, a lot of them will click on multiple pages. So that could be 14 flights. That could be 21 flights, for all we know. So. You need, you need to do think about the way you guys design systems and like the impact it's having on the environment. It's really crucial we all take responsibility for it. And also, cost, performance, and sustainability are all linked. If you take these approaches, you will drive down costs, you will reduce your carbon emissions, and you will increase performance. So it's like a win-win situation. Lastly, from moving to microservices now, Deploying a Sitecore application is a pain in the ass. I did say I wouldn't swear, but it really is. Uh, I think I'm allowed to on that one. It was taking us three days to deploy, deploy this monolithic application with all the testing, everything we had. Now we have dedicated microservices. We're down to like half a day, which is saving our clients huge amounts of money in our time and also saving us loads of gray hairs and stress, which is also fantastic. For, from, from a developer experience, it's much better. Um, they're the key stats around um, our implementation. Um, I wanted to say thank you as well to the, the Umbrico team. We're a gold partner, um, and the level of support we've received from Umbrico during this project has been outstanding. Thanks to Morton, I can see him over there, um, and all of his team for the support he's given us trying to figure this out, and also Muslim uh, and all the Umbrico support guys, and Mike as well, so thank you very much. Um, I'm the technical director at Tangent. Uh, this is us. I'm not going to talk about us for too long, because I know everyone rolls their eyes when you have these slides. But we do lots of enterprise builds for lots of big clients. Uh, we're based in London. We're also based in Newcastle and Valencia. And we're hiring at the moment across the globe. So if anyone likes this sort of stuff, hook me up on LinkedIn. Maybe you could come and like, work on this stuff with us. Um, thank you, everybody, for your time. Much appreciated. Um, any questions, I'll be on the, the, the panel later on. Cheers. <laughs>